Thank you very much for joining me tonight, uh, or tonight in New Zealand, but not tonight in India, obviously. Uh, I appreciate that you've taken the time out uh, to come and learn about my designs. So the first part of the lecture, I will just recap on how to fit Excel. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. I'm sure they, that Monica and Jody can cover that for you, but I'd just like to, to give you a, a background of how to fit it and to talk about one complicated case, and then I'll go on in the second half of the lecture and talk about comparing corneal sclerals and why I prefer them over a scleral design. So just so we make sure we're on the same page, the definition of a corneal lens is basically all its bearing is on the cornea and you have no tear reserve. For a corneal scleral lens, you have shear bearing on the cornea and sclera. Most of the bearing is on the cornea, uh, sorry, on the, on the cornea with little bearing on the sclera and you have limited tear reserve because you do get some tear exchange. With scleral lenses, we can divide them into mini sclerals and large sclerals, depending on their diameter. All the bearing is on the sclera, you don't touch the cornea, and you have with, with large lenses almost unlimited tear reserve, and the tears basically are trapped behind the lens and you don't get much tear exchange at all. So my design XL, we are talking about a corneal scleral lens, which has most of the bearing on the cornea. And you can see here from this OCT image, uh, here's our limbus here. The lens lands nicely inside the limbus, um, clears the limbus very slightly here, and then moves out to give you edge lift, very similar to a corneal lens. And you can see here from the fluorescent pattern, the landing zone is inside the limbus on the cornea. Where the scleral lens, here's our limbus. You can see the conjunctival epithelial cells here and you can see how they are trapped underneath the lens and that can cause some issues. And so this is a very good fitting scleral lens where you try to land the foot of the lens parallel to the conjunctival or to the sclera. So at conferences, one of the things that I always see scleral lens lectures mentioning is that we mustn't touch the cornea uh, with a scleral lens. And that is very true. If you are going to put a lens on the cornea that doesn't move, you will get problems. And typically scleral lenses do not move. So if you fit them and you fit them flat and you touch the cornea, you will have problems with them. You have to vault the cornea. So my philosophy here for my corneal scleral design is you have very minimal clearance over the apex of the cone or the edge of the graft, wherever that might be. You have 20 to 30 microns clearance over the limbus, although it may look like touch because there's not sufficient fluorescence there to get fluorescence. And then you go out from the limbus out to the edge of the lens with some fluorescent, about 40, 50 microns, to try to actually get the tear exchange up to those precious limbal cells. So as I mentioned, I just wanna quickly go through um, how to fit my Excel design. And this is a speed lecture. I'm not gonna go into any detail, just so you understand my five-step fitting system. I'm gonna pose uh, about five questions during the presentation. The first question I'm going to ask you, for those that know my fitting system, what is the second parameter you should consider with my five-step Rose K fitting system? So here are the five steps that I talk about, the diameter of the movement, the edge lift value, or the peripheral fit, the base curve, and the location. So the first parameter we always consider is the base curve. What's the second parameter? So the answer is the peripheral fit. Once you have the base curve correct with any of my designs, you then move to looking at the peripheral fit. So here's the order that you approach the fitting, base curve, peripheral fit, diameter location, and finally the lens movement. And even with Excel, with my semi-scleral lens design or corneal scleral, I still do talk about lens movement. I'd like to see some movement. So when choosing the base curve, uh, the first lens is based on what I call the condition guide. And there is guides that you can get um, from uh, your uh, suppliers there that will tell you how to choose the first lens. You fill the concave side of the lens with non-preserved saline. 
you add plenty of fluorescent, don't be afraid to put plenty of fluorescent in. And then you select the flattest base curve that shows no touch at the highest point of the cornea. Now I have just updated that. What I used to say was feather touch, choose the lens that gave you feather touch. But unfortunately that was interpreted so much, so differently by so many different fitters that I've now said, I want you to choose the lens, the flatter space curve that actually shows no touch at the highest point on the cornea. If you do that, you will not leave excessive touch at the apex. How do you know you've reached that point? You go 0.1 flatter and you then should see feather touch uh, just very, very lightly. And you can adjust the initial fit immediately. If you think it's right, you need to then leave it for a further 20 minutes and reevaluate the fit further. So you only need the settling time with Excel is quite short, uh, as short as 20 minutes. If the fluorescein you require is further, you just place it on the sclera, get the patient to blink a few times. You may need to manipulate the lens a little bit uh, and fluorescein should appear behind the lens. Again, I so the biggest problem people make with my Excel design is leaving the base curve flat. It is imperative you do not show bearing at the highest point on the cornea. Otherwise, it can cause lift off at the edge, binding corneal damage and discomfort. So here we have a lens that's just showing feather touch. That was the way I used to say to fit it. I'm now saying I don't want to see the touch. So I would regard both these fittings as a graft, where the edge of the graft is the highest place here. And I don't want to see touch there. I want to continue to steepen the base curve until I just clear that highest point on the cornea. And the second question I pose to you, what minimum depth of fluorescent microns is required to produce fluorescence? And I'll give you some options. So from five to 15 microns up to eight greater than 50 microns, because you can have small thicknesses of fluorescent and in fact, you don't have enough depth to get fluorescence. So what's the answer here? It is 25 to 35 microns. If you have less than this, it will look like touch. So even here, we've probably still got about 15 to 20 microns of clearance beneath that highest point on the cornea. Um, Topographers recognize this, and you can see from the simulated image from a Medmont topographer where uh, this point here corresponds to this zero point here. And here you're starting to just to see clearance at the apex of the cone around this point. And yet our tear layer thickness produced at the bottom here shows we still have around 35 microns of clearance. So, the simulated fluorescent images already recognize that you've got to have at least 20, 25 microns before you will get fluorescence. This is steep, this is flat, not difficult to tell from those images. So this is the correct fit. How do you know it? You go 0.1 flatter here and you should just see the apex of the cone touching. So this is the lens that you know that you want to fit. And if you're in doubt, you're better to go slightly steeper than flatter. You will not get into problems being a little steeper than being flatter. So as I mentioned, steeper than flatter. Approximately a 0.1 change, it depends on the base curve, is somewhere between 20 and 30 microns. Every time you steepen it by 0.1, you add between 20 and 30 microns to the tear layer thickness. So here, uh, this is a keratoconic fit. I used to say that was okay, but I now say that's a little bit flat. When the patient blinks, if you see the cone disappear, it's okay, it's acceptable. But if your patient blinks and you still see the touch here, it is flat. And as I said, I want to see uh, around 50 microns, a minimum, absolute minimum of 30 microns of clearance. So here's a keratoconics that I thought I'd fitted well. This is when I first started using my design. I left a little bit flat and after 10 hours of wear, you can see the problem this causes at the apex of the cone. 
uh, you start to get staining here, which is unacceptable. Here is a post lasik ectasia, which is acceptable, even though we're seeing touch here. As the patient blinks, we just see touch and then it goes. That is quite acceptable. I'd be very happy with that fit. Here is a, a pellucid case. Where are we going to leak? look for the steepest part? We're going to look down here at 270. We're not going to look up here, which we do with cones in this area here. We're going to look at the highest point here. And you can see again here, when the patient blinks, you just see touch and then it disappears. That is quite acceptable again. So peripheral fit. Are you going to observe the fluorescent pattern outside the limbus at positions around the clock? And you can judge the fluorescent pattern immediately on first insertion. And you're looking for a band of fluorescent at least uh, 0.8 to a millimeter wide or even slightly wider. You can reinsert fluorescent onto the sclera. If you put the fluorescent in the bowl of the lens and then do not look at the edge lift immediately, it will dissipate out from the edge and look tight. So make sure that when you're judging the edge lift that you always look at the fluorescent immediately after you put the fluorescent into the eye. So what we're aiming to try to achieve is being able to see the conjunctival vessels through the fluorescent from the limbus out, as you can see here. This is getting a little bit too open. I would, uh, in this case, reduce the edge lift by 0.5 or a, a decreased lift here, just to make it a little bit less. That's a little bit too much fluorescent. Uh, this is absolutely ideal. So if there's insufficient fluorescent, you increase the edge lift value. If it's excessive, you decrease it. And of course, you must look all around the clock because sclera is invariably uh, asymmetric and you must take note of that. And you've got to try to get the fluorescent as even as you can around the clock on the sclera. So this is insufficient lift. You can see this is very tight. We're not going to get any fluorescent underneath the edge of this lens. This is getting excessive and you can see small bubbles starting to appear. And those bubbles are going underneath and ending up underneath the apex here. Uh, and very within a couple of hours, you would have a very large bubble form underneath the lens. So if you find you put a lens in and you think the fit's fine, and two hours later you look at it and you've got a big bubble, the bubbles must come in from the edge somewhere. So you've got to hunt around the edge of the lens to find out where your edge lift is excessive. And this, of course, is ideal. We can see those blood vessels nicely here, which we can't see when we have excessive edge lift. So another good way of judging the edge lift is how easy fluorescent uh, is, is goes underneath the edge of the lens. And you can see here, simply by bringing the uh, tear meniscus layer up with the lid, you can see how easily the fluorescent enters underneath the lens. You should not use, need to use excessive force at all. So judging the edge lift is probably the hardest part uh, of my fitting uh, with Excel. And it's a combination of the fluorescent pattern, which we've talked about, the movement, which I'll talk about in a moment. Comfort, if you put it in, the lens in and the patient says, whoa, this is fantastic, I can't even feel it. You probably have a tight edge lift. In Excel, if the edge lift is tight, it will feel very comfortable initially, but long-term, it will cause you problems. So you do not want to leave it like that. How easy the lens is to remove, and I'll show you that in a moment and how easy fluorescent enters under the edge, which I've just shown you. So you have to consider quite a few factors when you're considering choosing the correct edge lift value. So onto the diameter, um, you can see here comparing a scleral lens at 18 millimeters to a corneal sclera. This is an XL on the eye. So XL is very similar to a soft lens. Uh, very, it comes out over the, onto the, uh, conjunctival or sclera, about the same as a soft lens. Whereas with a spheral lens, you often get some inferior temporal decentration, as you see here. Um, this is caused by the insertion of the interlocular muscles, which tend to push the lens uh, a little bit temporally. So the next question is, how far should a Rose K2XL extend outside the limbus to the edge of the lens? So how wide 
should the lens be from this point out to the edge of the lens? And I'll give you some options again here. Just give you 10 seconds or so to assimilate that. So what the correct answer is 1.3 to 1.5 millimeters. So how do we get that? That's what it looks like. As I said, very, very similar to a soft lens. What is that based on? The average horizontal visible iris diameter in the world is 11.8. So if we take my standard XL diameter, although you can choose diameters uh, much bigger and much smaller than that, that is the standard at 14.6. If you have a normal uh, iris diameter, we take that away, divide it by two, and that gives us our lap. So somewhere between 1.3 to 1.5 millimeters, I want to see. One millimeter is not sufficient and will cause you issues. Remember, um, if you look at the stats, corneas can vary in diameter from as big as 12.8 down to as small as 10.8. So it is something you need to consider. You can't ignore uh, that and just use always the standard diameter. Finally, lens movement. With scleral lenses, we don't talk about lens movement. With my design, I do talk about lens movement. And ideally, I want to see some movement, although it's much less than a corneal lens. The way I like to judge it is uh, get the patient to look up and blink. And you should see the lens on initial uh, insertion move between a half to one millimeter. After it settles, it might be considerably less than that, less than a 0.5 of a millimeter. But fitted correctly, I do want to see some movement of the lens. If you have excessive movement, it's usually because your edge lift is excessive and that will cause the lens to be uncomfortable. So here we have excessive uh, movement. Um, we're getting at least a millimeter, not more here. And here, um, this lens is just about bound. It's not moving at all. So what are two factors from the list below will increase the lens movement? Decreasing the diameter, flattening the base curve, steepening the base curve, making it bigger, or increasing the edge lift. So I'll give you a moment there, what two factors will make the lens move more, will increase the lens movement? The obvious one is obviously increasing the edge lift. If you fit my corneal lens designs, you'll know that increasing the edge lift will always increase the lens movement. But the one which is a bit of a surprise is this one. Steepening the base curve will make the lens move a little more. The flatter you go and the more, the thinner the tear layer between the cornea and the back of the lens the less movement you get. So do remember that if you want to make the lens move more, you need to steepen the base curve and or increase the edge lift. You have many uh, asymmetric options. Uh, this is a lecture in itself and I'm very happy to do that lecture for you anytime if you'd like me to, but just to mention very briefly the toric and asymmetric options that are available. And there's a special guide available which goes through these for you. So you can have toric periphery, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, ACT, where you tuck in one quadrant of the lens, segment-specific asymmetric act, where you take a small segment and you change the edge lift over that segment only, quadrant-specific edge lifts, where you can change the edge lift in each of the four different quadrants, and then front torques and back surface torques. But you also have many combinations of all the above. And in fact, in total, there's about 150 different options available when you take into account uh, my five rigid lens designs, plus all the options that are available. By far the most common that are used are the toric periphery, the act, the quadrant specific edge lifts, and of course, front toric. So these four are commonly used with my Excel design. So how do you choose between quad using quadrant specific edge lifts, toric peripheries and act? If we make this blue dotted line represent the limbus and the black 
circle represent the edge of the lens. Typically, the optic zone on XL is somewhere between eight and nine millimeters. It's a spheric, so it's quite a large back optic zone. Usually it means that you cover, get good coverage over the pupil because these lenses uh, center up very well. So if you choose quadrant specific edge lifts, all you're going to change is the fit outside the limbus. You will change nothing of the fit over the cornea. So you can say, well, I want a standard edge lift here. I want an increase here. I want a decrease here. I want a standard here. So you can put, uh, you can change one quadrant or you can change up to four quadrants. And although I've represented them at zero and 180 here, you don't have to be, it could be at 20 and 110, et cetera. So those quadrants can be oblique as well. Of course, they have to be 90 degrees apart though. If you use the toric periphery, well, how does that vary? It will change the fit obviously outside the limbus, but it will also change the fit on the peripheral cornea because the toric curves start just outside the uh, back optic zone and increase out here. So it will change the fit uh, over the peripheral cornea as well as outside the limbus. So if you only want to change the fit outside the limbus, you use quadrant specific edge lifts. If you want to also change the fit on the peripheral cornea and outside the limbus, you would use a, a toric uh, periphery. Finally, ACT. When we use ACT or asymmetric corneal technology, we tend to talk about changing the lift or the fit in one particular quadrant. In fact, it does affect nearly half of the lens. The steepening is most commonly put at 270, where the lens lifts off, particularly in Pellucid, uh, where you have very, very low, uh, high, high areas, very low on the cornea. But it actually starts steepening just below the horizontal meridian, steepens more and more, and you have your maximum steepening at the axis of the X that you specify. So just go into that a little bit more detail. Quadrant specific edge lifts, you will affect the fit only outside the limbus. And here's a case where you can see the lens is tight in this quadrant here. All I did was want to increase the lift in this quadrant. I was very happy about the lift here. You can see the lift here is tight. It's pretty good in this quadrant. So I increased the edge lift at axis 225, halfway between the 180 and the 270. So when you're ordering it, you state the center of the axis, or you could say, I want to increase the lift between uh, 180 and 270, but in most cases, you just specify the center of that axis. And you can see here when I did this, immediately I opened this up. The lens will have prism ballast to help it locate. You don't have to think about that. That's automatically included in the design. So when you put the lens in, it doesn't matter where you put it in, it will after two or three blinks turn around and align this quadrant up correctly where you require that excess lift. Toric periphery, if we take an example here, remember when we use toric periphery, we are going to change the fit both outside the limbus and on the peripheral cornea as well. You should use them in about 40% of cases. They're very underutilized. People tend not to use it. Uh, uh, it is uh, something you must be aware of. And my standard toric periphery puts a 1.2 toric difference in the two meridians. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. So question five, what percentage of scleras are spherical? That there's, they have less than actually half a doctor of tericity. And what are options? less than 10% or in fact going right through to greater than 40%. So this actually surprised me. Uh, this is a study done um, that was presented at GSL conference about two years ago. And I, I was really amazed just um, what the result was here. So in fact, less than 10% of scleras are truly spherical. Does that mean 90% of the cases you have to use asymmetric options? Absolutely not. A bit of asymmetry around the clock doesn't matter as long as you're not getting a staining 
or you're not getting bubbles coming underneath the edge and the patient's comfortable and the cornea's happy, you don't have to have a perfect fit all around the clock. But typically, you can expect to use them in about 40% of cases. So here's a toric periphery, and you can see the laser lines are put on the lens, lined along the flattest axis. So with the standard 1.2 tericity, the lens will be steepened in one quadrant, typically in the vertical quadrant by 0.6, and it'll be flattened in the opposite quadrant by 0.6 giving you 1.2 difference in tericities between the two. Do remember that when you use a toric periphery, if the lens was sitting here and here, and then you lift the fit here and here, the lens will fit back a little bit closer to the cornea. So if you are going to order a toric periphery, always add 0.1 steeper to the base curve to compensate for the, um, the way the lens is going to fit back flat to the cornea. Otherwise, when this comes back, it's going to fit flatter than the trial lens fitted. You don't need to state the axis. Uh, these lenses center up very well, uh, unless, of course, you want to put residual astigmatism on the front, then the laboratory will need to know the difference between the back flatus axis and where they need to put the front axis astigmatism. So the laser lines are always put along and they will line along the flattest axis. And you can see here, it doesn't matter if you put this lens in, in a couple of blinks, it will turn around and you can see how stable it is. So it's very easy to add um, tourist to the front of the lens if you want to. I'm gonna talk about one case before I get on to comparing sclerals and corneal sclerals. Um, Jody asked me to include this and I think it was a, a good call. This is a complicated case, and they're not all like this, but I just want to take you through this to show you what you actually can do with this design. This was a 27-year-old male with advanced keratoconus um, and a significant pterygium here, and you can see here which the lens would have impinged on and caused problems with. Uh, you can see very low cone here. They could not fit this eye at all uh, with a corneal lens because of the location of that cone they couldn't get a satisfactory result. You can see the cone here it does look like a, a low oval cone. It doesn't look like pellucid. And you can see the first lens they tried was six, seven, definitely flat here. And you can see it's tight here, right around the clock. It lifts off here probably because the lens is lifting, uh, is bearing here, which is lifting this off. So the edge lift doesn't look too bad here, but it's very tight, very, very tight here. It's tight around here. And it's also tight here, which means we do have some symmetry with the lens being tight here and here. So the first lens that the practitioner ordered was a 6.6 .6 base. That was uh, 0.1 uh, steeper than what we had before. If we play the video, it looks like we've cleared the cone now. The edge lift they went to was a plus one, or well, that's a standard increase. And they decided to put a toric periphery with a 1.8 tericity. What did they comment on? Difficult to get fluorescent underneath the edge of the lens, suggesting it's a bit tight. Slight blanching of the vessels you can see here, again, suggesting it's tight, but it does appear to clear the apex. So the next lens they ordered, uh, sorry, this is, uh, sorry, going back there. So with this lens on the eye after six hours, what did we see? We saw some signs and always have a very good look. If you take the lens off, stain the cornea, <coughs> excuse me, have a very good look at what you've got left here. So what did they find? They found there was corneal staining observed in the area of the pterygium here, quite definite staining, but also at the apex of the cone. Also, they had circular indentation on the cornea. What does that indicate? lack of movement. You can't get this amount of indentation if the lens is moving. And you can see the slight standing along uh, that indentation ring, again showing lack of movement. So they decided to increase the sagitta or the step in the base curve to try to increase the movement and also clear the apex of the cone. They also decided to uh, incorporate uh, reverse act so they're going to put ACT here, which means we're going to lift 
the edge of the lens in this area only. So this was the next lens ordered. It was 0.2 steeper than the last lens I showed you. They increased the edge lift a little bit around the clock by 0.5. They went from a 1.8 toric periphery to a two toric periphery, and they used reverse act here. So you can tuck the edge in, or you can tuck it out. If you want to tuck the lens out at the edge, you simply call it reverse act. So they took a stab at that and said, I want a one and a half uh, reverse act at here at 270. So after 10 hours of wear with this lens, uh, a better result, but what do we see? There's a few clues here. So again, we've still got this ring indentation. Not much staining here, a little bit, but not too much. We have got some staining here and here, not anything significant here, and still some staining over the pterygia. But when we look here, we've got now injection in the vertical meridian, but really nothing here, and a small amount of injection here. So what does that indicate? That probably we want to increase the movement a little bit, probably steepen it a little bit to get rid of this, and we need to increase uh, the amount of ACT to try to lift the lens over that point here. So remember that circular staining shows we don't have sufficient movement. So here's the final lens that was given. And you can see it's a nice fit. We don't have any touch showing. We still are a little bit light here, but it's, it's looking good. And if you look at the laser line on this lens right there. So I pull it off axis and look how fast it returns back to its primary position. So a very, very good result there. So eventually, just going back to that previous slide, you can see these two areas of injection here now suggest we are too tight in the vertical meridian and too open here. So we decided to, in fact, reduce the amount of toric periphery uh, back to 1.8, which was the previous lens. And as I said, you can see now, we've got a lovely pattern around the edge. So the final lens was 6.3, um, edge lift of plus two, giving us a lovely edge lift, a 1.8 tericity and reverse act here of 2.5. So we've really lifted the lens over this area here. So the result was after 10 hours, a very acceptable result, very light uh, superficial staining, nothing significant over the pterygium good vision and the patient was very happy and the practitioner recommended to free fill the bowl every three to four hours. So if you look at the asymmetry on this lens, it's staggering how much asymmetry we can now cut into a lens surface. And even if you put this lens in, in the incorrect position within a couple of blinks, it will turn around to the correct position. So this is an extreme case. Uh, it's never this complicated with the majority of cases, but I just have thrown this in to show you what you can do with this design. You have so many asymmetric options available. So now moving on to why I prefer corneal sclerals to scleral lenses and trying to point out the differences. We've seen such a dramatic increase in use of scleral lenses over the last five years. What are the factors would have driven this change? Mainly comfort. No doubt they're more comfortable than a corneal lens initially. Stability, they're very stable, and they give very stable vision. And for certain environments, like dusty environments or for sport, where you need a stable lens, they're absolutely ideal. And don't forget financial, they're better returns for the labs. Uh, the labs love to sell you a spiral lens simply because there is, uh, they don't take a lot more time to cut. Uh, but there is a lot more margins in them. So don't forget the labs will ultimately want to push their scleral lens design. But is there any possible downside? Um, there was a poster done um, in the GSLS Congress in Las Vegas in 2017, where they looked at, I, I think about 200 different scleral lens cases, and they reported over a quarter experience midday fogging, that's where you had to take the lens out, refresh the fluid in it and put it back in again. Uh, about a quarter also had limbal hyperemia, which is not ideal. And 
of the population showed corneal staining. So the, we don't, they're certainly not without their complications. Also, at the same conference, Pat Caroline reported between 25 to 30 percent of the scleral lens wearers have conjunctival prolapse, and we'll go more into that in a moment. So let's compare some factors on these two different types of lenses. Lens settling time, the tear exchange, uh, diameter, midday fogging, conjunctival changes such as prolapse, and handling and removal. So lens settening time. There was a good paper done with a 15 millimeter scleral lens uh, by the Mayo Clinic several years ago where they looked at lens settening after two hours of wear. And they found that the mean lens clearance decreased by approximately 107 microns at two hours after placing it on the eye, which represented approximately, and remember that word approximately, 50% of the initial lens clearance but there was huge variations between individuals. Each one of these lines represents the individual case. So in one case, they started off with over 360 microns of clearance and ended up here at about 150. Another case started off at 80 and didn't really show a lot of decrease. So how, what was their conclusion of the study? With a 15 millimeter scleral lens, approximately 50% of the uh, settling took place over about a two hour period, which means in the next two hours, you're gonna have further settling. So the lens is gonna to continue to settle for at least four hours. But their final conclusion was the optimum time required for adequate lens settling has yet to be determined. So what is the minimum time? This is your now question six. You need to allow Rose K2 XL to settle after insertion to judge the optimum base curve fit. And here's your options. I have mentioned the actual correct answer already, and it's 20 minutes. So you can put the lens in, and within 20 minutes, you can judge the, if you all got the final fit correct. You don't have to wait two hours or four hours. So for it's, it's much more convenient uh, and much more accurate than trying to estimate the amount of settings that's going to occur. So usually within 20 minutes, and why? Is because the corneal epithelium compresses only slightly, about 20 to 30 microns maximum, whereas the, uh, the conjunctiva can compress over 150 microns, and it's very unpredictable how much it will compress. Um, this was sent to me from a fitter in Spain where he looked at the settling with Rose K at XL. At this time here at 10.03, he put the lens in and took an OCT image, which showed 85 microns of clearance uh, at the apex of the cone here. After 30 minutes, he recorded again. He still had 84 microns. It hadn't settled at all. And eight hours later, he took at this time here another OCT image and still had 85 microns. So you expect XL to settle relatively quickly. You can have the odd case that will settle, take longer, but in most cases, you can judge the settling after 20 minutes. What about tear exchange? With a corneal scleral lens, we can demonstrate some movement and we can demonstrate tear exchange. We showed you that push up and down test. With a scleral lens, it's very difficult to get tear exchange underneath the lens. There was a uh, study done quite recently, about a year ago, where they tried to evaluate how much tear exchange you got with a scleral lens. They took um, readings, and I'll tell you how, how at a moment, at 20 minutes and five hours after insertion on 20 patients that had not ever worn a scleral lens. They did it on three separate visits, and how they measured it, they put fluorescin on the bulbar bulge, conjunctiva, and then they clocked how long it took for the fluorescent to end it up underneath the edge of the lens. So their conclusion, some tear flow was observed on subjects with healthy corneas. These are all healthy patients' corneas at 20 minutes and in some patients after five hours of lens insertion. However, after five hours of lens where roughly one third of subjects had absolutely no tear flow, into the post lens tens reserve. 
our patients don't wear their lenses for five hours, they wear them for 10 hours. So this lack of tear flow gets worse and worse the longer the patient wear the lenses because the lens continues to settle over the wearing time. So the longer they wear it, the less you're going to get tear exchange underneath the lens. As I mentioned with Excel, it's very easy to show tear exchange when you have the edge lift correct. You should be able to easily demonstrate tears moving underneath the edge of the lens. With, uh, so what's the risk without tear exchange? Reduced oxygen levels, trap um, metabolites and discarded epithelial cells, pH and osmolarity changes under the lens must occur. And this in a recent study, I haven't gone into it, has actually been measured. You can actually measure these changes. This must pose a high risk of long-term um, metabolic and physiological complications such as microcysts and infections. And a recent webinar that I attended in New Zealand only a week ago, uh, where a, a local New Zealand practitioner compared uh, complications in uh, his lens where prior to lens, uh, prior to 2012, and then from 2012 to 2018, when he started to use fleural lenses, has shown a rapid increase in his complication rate compared with corneal lenses. Corneal lenses by far are still by far our safest, but they're not suitable for everyone, obviously. What about lens diameter? If you land a lens totally on the conjunct tie of the landing zone, and therefore the overall diameter lens to be bigger, why? What you want to achieve with a spheral lens is a shoe or a, the fitting here, which is absolutely parallel to the conjunctiva or to the sclera. And typically, uh, it has to be reasonably large to clear that bearing area. If it's too small, then the lens will dig into uh, the conjunctiva and eventually into the sclera. I compare it to walking in snow. Try walking in snow in shoes and then increase the bearing area, put snowshoes on, and you won't sink in. It's exactly the same reason. The bigger the bearing area, the less indentation you're going to get. So lenses that land entirely on the conjunctiva need to be larger to prevent the lens sinking into the conjunctiva and causing consequent binding. Uh, it is estimated that you need at least a three millimeter landing zone to support a spheral lens to prevent it sinking and subsequent binding. Therefore, by definition, spheral lenses need to be bigger than corneal scleral lenses. So there's some advantage of keeping the lens small as well. You have better alignment with the sclera. There's been several papers to show that up to 15 millimeters, the eye is more rotationally symmetric, less tericity. So therefore, the need for asymmetric options such as tight peripheries, ACT, et cetera, are reduced. The bigger you go, the more you will need these asymmetric options. Easy to handle, uh, very similar to a soft lens, less uh, fear provoking because they are not a large lens. What about midday fogging? In a study here with by Pat Cryoline, he reported that approximately 30% of scleral contact lens wearers experience a significant decrease in vision after two to four hours uh, of wear due to solution contamination. And work, work done by Maria Walker at the Pacific University found that although the protein content in the tear layer was unchanged, the lipid and co content increased, which is basically what's expelled um, by the cells in the conjunct, the goblet cells in the conjunctiva. So very infrequent with corneal scleral lenses. Why? Minimum tear layer thickness and the conjunctiva with the goblet cells is not trapped underneath the lens. You can have it occur, but it's very, very rare. So here again, just to remember, with Excel, you're not trapping the conjunctiva underneath the um, underneath the lens here, whereas with a spheral lens, you are trapping some conjunctiva underneath the lens, and therefore any contents from the goblet cells will remain trapped underneath the lens. Also, with Excel, we're advocating a, a maximum uh, lens tear layer thickness of 50 microns and minimum of 30. With scleral lenses, they talk about a 200 micron minimum volt. So it's a much greater volt 
And they have shown that the, the lower the vault, the less likelihood of midday fogging. What about conjunctival changes? Um, this is seen quite frequently. And Pat Caroline again says up to 30% of patients get this conjunctival prolapse eventually. Not a pretty sight, cannot occur with corneal XL because again, we're landing the lens on the cornea. We're not trapping it in. And I, I think I've pushed this point enough that uh, we are the conjunctivi here does not go underneath the lens on the cornea. So we should not get midday fogging or, or conjunctival prolapse. Handling and removal. The lens when fitted correctly should come out very easily. You can see here, I haven't had to use excessive force. The plunger was always placed on the edge of the lens, never centrally. If you try to pull it out centrally, the eye tends to follow you. Um, scleral lenses require a lot more force to remove, about 100 to 200 grams for removal. And often you have to break the suction with a scleral lens, get, your, uh, get the lid uh, underneath the edge of the lens or your fingernail to break the suction before you can remove them. But is that such a big deal? Is it a big deal that scleral lenses actually suck to the eye much more than a corneal scleral lens? There is some room for concern. The first came up in a lecture that I saw at the GSLS Congress, and there was a paper published in 2019, which talked about interocular lens pressure changes in scleral lens wearers. So what they did is they um, established a, an interocular pressure by using a tonneau pen, and they measured the pressure superior, about three or four millimeters superior at 12 o'clock through the conjunctival or through the square, recorded that, put the lens on, and after about four hours, you see 4.5 hours plus or 3.3 hours, they measured the pressure again and compared it this is exactly the same place and compared it with uh, the pressure before the lens was placed on the eye. 19% of patients showed an increase of greater than 10 millimeters. That's quite a large increase. One patient increased by 15 millimeters and the average for all the group was a five millimeter increase. This uh, study was repeated um, at BIPAC Caroline at the GS LS Congress this year, which I attended, he did 31 uh, subjects and found a very similar result that in fact, in nine eyes, 29% uh, an increase greater than 10 millimeters and one subject had actually 18 millimeters of increase. That would be of huge concern to me because although nobody's done the same experiment with Excel, uh, one would not expect it because the suction forces are not nearly as great. We don't really understand why this is happening. I'm sure we'll probably another year will go by and we will understand what is causing this increase in pressure. But it's one thing if you're fitting a scleral lens, you should be monitoring fields and discs and pressures. So to finish up, what are the advantages of a corneal scleral lens over a scleral lens design? Much less binding than scleral lenses. Conjunctival compression is less much less risk of increasing the interlocular pressure, significantly more tear exchange than you get with sclerals, not as much as corneals, but much more than sclerals, which gives you some movement to refresh the tear lay underneath the lens, which I still believe is important. Pose less risk for corneal grafts. I've been to several lectures over the last couple of years where scleral lens fitters will not fit um, scleral lenses to grafts. They feel the risks are too great, particularly with old grafts. If you're fitting an old graft with a scleral lens, be very, very careful and do an endothelial count and make sure you have a reasonable endothelial count before you fit it. I would much rather fit a corneal lens if I could. If I can't fit a corneal lens, I would much rather fit a corneal scleral lens. And one other thing, at examination to check the cornea, you can apply fluorescin onto the conjunctiva couple of blinks and you should see it circulate underneath the lens. With a scleral lens, you can't do that because you can't get fluorescent underneath the lens easily. So you need to take the lens out, you need to put fluorescent in, put the lens back in, 
but then you've changed the whole fit because you've then got to wait four hours for the lens to actually settle again. So you can check the fit of the lens with Excel by simply applying fluorescin onto the conjunctiva. Um, because it's smaller, a reduced need for toric options. It settles within normally within 20 minutes. You don't have to wait four hours. You don't have to send the patient away. No conjunctival. I've never had prolapse reported to me with Excel. Corneal bogging, which I haven't covered today, is where you get superficial staining across the cor whole cornea. It's basically caused by trapping tears behind the lens or trapping solutions behind the lens. You don't get that with the Excel. Midday fogging can occur with Excel, but is very uncommon, which means you have to change the solution behind the lens much less frequently. And that's a big advantage. You know, taking the lens out every three or four hours to refill it and put it back in is not ideal at all. Don't need to be as large as sclerals, easier to remove because the suction forces are much less. So this or this, I know which I would prefer. So in summary, why do I prefer corneal sclerals over scleral lenses? I believe they can be used in the majority of cases where a scleral lens is indicated and give the same advantages of comfort and stability that sclerals provide without many of the potential downsides that setting off the cornea can cause. So there is a place, I'm not trying to knock sclerals. I think we now realize they have a place, but given the option, most cases you can fit with a corneal scleral where a scleral lens is indicated. And I'd much prefer to fit it and get that tear exchange and keep that cornea healthy rather than using a scleral lens. So thank you very much for joining me today. I understand I'm going to take some questions at the moment. Um, I hope we've got a few. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. We are fortunate in New Zealand to have a um, COVID relatively well under control, but I understand particularly in India, you've still really got uh, a lot of challenge. And I look forward to another session uh, with you again soon. Thank you very much.